good about it. I feel good about it. I was trying to get Brady to make a dinosaur noise while he was gone. He made one, didn't he? No, but I want like a velociraptor. A velociraptor. That's what I want to hear. Don't you? I'm so excited for Jurassic Park. I know, that's why I want you to make are you gonna go opening night? I think I am. I love Jurassic Park so much. When you go, are you do you do like popcorn drink the whole? I I don't like popcorn like oh. normally. No, no, normally, but oh, okay. movie th- movie theater popcorn. Yeah, you have to, right? Like, it's just the vibe. Do you eat it with candy? No, I get I get the movie theater popcorn with a lot of butter on it and a mm-hmm. lot of salt because mm-hmm. I'm just there, and so it's like my little yeah. splurge. And then you get a cherry coke. Oh. I'm not a coke person. I'm not a cherry coke. Cherry coke. Cherry coke, huh? Have you ever had popcorn and, um. Milk duds. No, I'm not about to break my teeth. Together. Ugh. Ugh, so good. Yeah, Jurassic Park's going to be awesome. Can't wait. Delicious. June June 10th? June 10th. Are you going that night? Yeah. Do you have the theater picked out? It's close close to my house. Do you go to like the stadium seat, the one where you get like the big chair? Uh Uh-huh. I always fall asleep in those. I'm going to splurge. I saw Jurassic Park the first one when I was younger, and... Oh, what is uh, what is your fascination with Jurassic Park? I just really like dinosaurs. Did you like dinosaurs as a kid? I used to read all the books. I used to watch all the like the paleontologist. Did you collect yeah. uh, like little figurines mm-hmm. and stuff? You did. Mm-hmm. Figurines. I was, I was really big yeah. on, on dinosaurs. What's your favorite dinosaur? Uh, I mean, everyone likes T Rex, and I think I kind of like T Rex too, because they're big and they like found like the biggest one in Montana. Oh, and really? So I was like that Montana tie mm-hmm. as well. Is that your favorite? Yeah. Triceratops, that was my favorite. That's so, that was so weak. Dude, he's got three giant horns on his head. You know what's better than a Triceratops? Every dinosaur ever made. No, no. What about a Stegosaurus? I don't know what any of these are. You don't? No. Velociraptor? What's the flying one? Pterodactyl. Pterodactyl. Yeah. I actually know quite a bit about dinosaurs as it turns dinosaurs out. Dinosaurs are so cool. They're fascinating. Have you ever been out like on a dig or anything like that? No. I found some Would like you? I found some like shells and stuff when I was in uh, Montana doing fisheries work a lot. Like, would you be into that? Like oh if yeah. Somebody I was like, t- "Hey, we have a dig." I would totally be into that. So we just throw that out there if anybody out there is a uh, just yeah. happens to listen to this podcast and they're a, a is a paleontologist. Yeah, paleontologist. Yeah. I feel like I did that for school. <laughs> you went out. That's what your degree is in is paleontology. <laughs> But it's, but it's, but it's one, of those thi- one of those things, though, that I realized when I was quite young that I probably can't make any money doing that. So I never really pursued it as a career, but I would it have loved to. It has to be like to. through grants, right? Yeah. All soft, mo- soft money stuff. Mm-hmm. What, how do you feel about uh, like people saying now that dinosaurs really were like, you know, a lot of them may, may have been feathered? Yeah, I have you totally that? believe that, yeah. What do you mean feathered? Yeah, like fe- everything came from you birds. just turned mine way down. I can't hardly hear myself. You don't want to hear yourself anyway, dude. It's too fucking loud. It hurts my ears in here. Hello? What do you think? Mic check. Mine still sounds low, but whatever you Perfect, you're saying, dude. I'll just put it, and put it in my mouth. No, don't move it. The, <laughs> what you're hearing is not what it is. You say that, but it's always too quiet. <laughs> I, re- I really want all that Jurassic Park stuff in the intro, so that was a good Was set. it in the intro? Did you have that recording? Yeah, we were recording the whole time. This one over here controls what you hear. This is what it, the actual one that yeah. matters. I feel less excited about the possibility of dinosaurs being feathered. Why? They just seem, I don't know, more, not, more not, tame? As, not as cool. You? Hmm. They say every one of them had feathers on? I don't I don't know if every one of them, but they're saying that they, they were likely feathered. Like, you know, it's, it's like T-Rex is just a giant chicken out there with... I mean, you look at, Sharp like, a, a raven foot or any sort of bird feet, they really mimic... Turkey? Yeah. I know. All right. All right. We're back. I think we added it up, and this is episode 16 of the Big Hunt Guys podcast. Woo! Trail, thank yep. you for coming back down. <laughs> Thanks for having to me. To join Neville and I. <laughs> thank you. In the tent. In the Sky Dome. We're back. Again, we don't have any art in here. Same old, same old. Same old. It setup. doesn't smell quite as bad. It's airing out, I think. What are uh, episode milestones? Like, having your 20th one? Should we have, like, a party or something? Yeah. 20th episode? What's your 20th anniversary? Is that, like, uh, I don't know. Wood? Wood. <laughs> what? <laughs> <I'm dumb. laughs> Whoa. Wood. <laughs> what? <laughs> there's, there's like, isn't that, like, paper is one of them? There's, yeah. like, silver. Yeah, I just, I don't know what they are. Copper. Diamond. I don't know. Diamond, yeah. Platinum. 
I, I don't know what it is. But we we should. We should have a barbecue or something. Yeah. yeah. 20th episode, we'll have a podcast four, barbecue. Four more to go. We'll have to take 20 shots. Oh. I think we should just bring the stove in here, and then we'll cook in the Sky Dome while we're podcasting. Let's grill up some, some steaks. Yeah. Some backcountry steaks on the little jet boil. <laughs> that sounds kind of tasty. Yeah. I don't think Porter would let would, us do that. Well, that would try to get rid of the smell out of here, this smoky smell from the stove. It's a lot less than it has been. It's, yeah. air, it's airing out finally, feels like. All right. So right into the office. <laughs> so we are at a point in time where we have a bunch of tags in our pocket. Mm-hmm. Right? You, got, you guys got some tags. I got some tags. And all our thoughts now are kind of rolling into scouting season. Yeah. So I just want to pick you guys' brains on summer scouting, maybe fall, early fall scouting, e-scouting, all that stuff, and how it all comes together to try to make your hunts a little bit more successful and how you kind of judge having a bunch of tags and which one can you go e-scouting on, which one's just going – or which one boots on the ground scouting, which one's e-scouting only, and there's some strategies and tactics that each of you guys are doing. Mm-hmm. When do you start thinking about scouting? Like The moment I draw a tag. Really? Oh, yeah. Is the first step like e scouting? Then I first would assume. First step right? yep. Yeah. So, for example, for myself, I picked up you know Idaho over the counter deer tag December first. Mm-hmm. I've already been looking December first on that unit, and I've been continually going through that until I like drew another tag, and then I kind of switched my you know gears over to another tag for a little bit. But like I'm already diving in to as much info as I can pull in, just soaking up all the you know old weather data, old snowpack information, you know other. You know, anything I can right now to try to, like, help me out on this journey of do you, being a more successful hunter. Do you have a game plan already for that? I actually do, yeah. I oh, actually yeah. have some general points yeah. already marked down. That's yeah. amazing. I probably have 30, 30 waypoints marked already mm-hmm. of, like, potential areas. Obviously, I need to start diving in a little bit more and, like, looking at things a little bit closer. But I have just, like, that big picture stuff started. Like, where can I potentially access? I'm already looking at access points. Is that the first thing you look at? Access, yeah. Access. Not just for myself, but where other people might be accessing from, too. Trying to figure out all those different places you can get into the mountain range that I'm going into and try to use that to my advantage. Because other people might be, you know, if it's an area near a town, you might have a bunch of people camping in, or staying in a hotel in town and going up in the mountain range. So, obviously, those people, to me, they have to wake up earlier to get up to the mountain and they have to hike in if they're going to try to, you know, day hunt from a hotel. So I try to think of that. I try to think of all the people who are going to go out there and backpack hunt and try to figure out all these little core zones of pressure, basically. So are you looking at roads? Roads, yep. Roads, roads and tra- tra- trailheads. Trail heads. Mm-hmm. Are you looking at, uh, like, how much do you guys, do you ever do this? Like, go back and look at aerial imagery just to look at trailheads, see if oh, see yeah. if there's vehicles, and if yeah. so, how much and how many? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, though, our... Our unit, New Mexico, mm-hmm. it just happens to be that Google Earth imagery on it is, like, September 15th. Mm-hmm. So I can see where everyone's parked at and all That's the trailheads. Yeah. Fortunate. And that is handy. I mean, it's. I guess it tells two things, right? It tells that that's where people are accessing. That's where, you know, it also tells, like, you know, historically, that's probably areas where people are finding elk, right? right. They're, yeah. they're, they're accessing areas. Yep. How do you deal with that? Like... I mean, for example, Brady, would you stay away from, uh, like, a trailhead if you saw an aerial image and it had four or five vehicles there? No. You wouldn't, no. You wouldn't avoid it? Uh-uh. I wouldn't avoid it, but I would just keep that in the back of my mind, like, hey, there's going to be a lot of pressure here. Mm-hmm. There's pressure for a reason. Right. So, yeah, there could be a higher population of animals there. Or maybe it's, you know, something or whatever that is easy to access in the mountains. Or you got to think of, too, like, you could have 15 vehicles at a trailhead. They're not all going to the same spot. There's no way they're all going to the same spot. Yeah, people kind of self-regulate, right? I mean, people don't want to hunt on top of each other yeah. e- either. <laughs> and there, you, you got to think, like, mountains are so big, there could be a little ridge with a little basin that some guy's going to hunt, or he's been hunting that for so long, and maybe that's only a mile or two from the trailhead, and that's his comfort level of where he wants to go. Other people might go five miles, other people might go a little bit further, and then everyone just branches out from there. And it's like, it's, it's discouraging right away, yes, if you pull up and there's a bunch of people, but you got to realize that they're going to be dispersed for the most part and if they're back there you just deal with it and yeah. you go further you go do things or you talk to them and mm-hmm. like hey where are you going yeah but for the most part you're trying to, you're trying to get away from I'm people trying to get so away from people yeah. because like i always say i, I want to hunt animals on their own terms i want to get away from a crowd like yeah we can kill animals right next to a trailhead or like we talked about earlier today mm-hmm. like you've killed a bunch of giant deer i like that yeah <laughs> closer i like that <laughs> a little bit less of the back out <laughs> yeah i like 
I mean, I, I do look at it just like you do. I don't overlook country, though, just because mm-hmm. it is close to a road or a trailhead, you know. I think there's times when people will walk past things, oh, yeah. you know. I think they walk past a, a drainage just because the trail's cut and it's easy walking, whereas you might have, like, a little offshoot that doesn't look like much, but it's super, you know, steep or inaccessible mostly. Like, I, I don't completely cross that off. Yeah, it's like that barrier of entry stuff. Yeah. Like, a lot of people would be like, oh, a trail starts here and it goes straight uphill. That could be a barrier of entry. But to me, that's easy access if it goes uphill right away. The things, the areas I think are worse if you start at a trailhead and it instantly goes downhill for quite a while. Mm. Because then when you got to come out, you're like, shit, now I have to come up that big giant hill at the end with heavy weight on, big pack. And that's kind of always miserable. Mm-hmm. And so I think those are the areas I look to where it's like, hey, if there's a trail that goes downhill for quite a ways, drops you a lot of elevation, and you get to climb back up elevation again later, it's like a lot of people might not want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I look for those too. Um, I think it's interesting. I think a lot of people, my, myself included, I think there's been times when I'll start off on a trailhead and I'll, I'll fall in love with, like, you know, getting to a destination, an area. Mm-hmm. You know, like I'm going – five miles this way and I'm going to go into this drainage, you know? And a lot of the times I think people, myself, like I said, you just put your head down and you go, right? Yeah. And you don't necessarily take inventory of maybe what's around you that you might be missing on your way. So, I don't know, I think that's all, all worth considering and all, all worth that scouting process. And a lot of that, you, I think you can do, just like you're saying, you can do that online before you even mm-hmm. you know, set foot in the unit, right? Yeah. I like to have that big picture plan of where am I going to attack things from way ahead of time. Yeah. I want to know that unit like the back of my hand before I step foot. Yeah, I'm not that good at that. I'm I'm not. Just I'm, like to, I'm I'm just not. Like I'll I'll pick out an area and uh you know I'll have maybe like A, B and C and I'll kind of work down my my list, but a lot of it I I learn a lot like just when I'm out there, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why I'd like for me boots on the ground if I can, you know, getting in the field weather so in the summer and a lot of the times it's even just during the hunt, you know, like I'm glassing and looking around the landscape and I'm you know, then I'm pulling up my map on my phone and I'm looking at it going, okay, maybe, you know, there. But I'm, I'm not that great. No. Are you good? No. Yeah, having a plan in place before? I mean, I usually have, like, area I think I'm going to go, maybe, like, a couple camping spots, and like, decent glassing spots. Mm-hmm. Kind of like where I – I mean, it's usually, like, where I can park my truck. <laughs> yeah. And yep. then other than that, it's – yeah, I'm kind of similar to that. Or just start reading the land once I get out there and – yeah. I mean, I'm just looking for sign. Like, I could have a waypoint that I think's a good spot, and I get off there, and there's no sign, then it's like, all right, I got to move on. So that brings us to a good point. Like, beyond, so you found a trailhead, you found roads, you found access, and you've kind of explored that. And I think I would say all of us have probably had the, uh, I would say almost every hunt, we show up to a hunt. You, you tell me if you're if I'm wrong, Brady. You show up to a hunt, and it looks very different, even though you've scouted on Google Earth, right? It always does. I mean, yeah. it, it looks very, very different, you know? How do you figure for that i mean do you can you i don't think you can i mean i think it just comes by experience over the years to know what that terrain looks like on a map and then you could correlate it with what actually looks like in real life but you're always going to be intimidated yeah and it's always gonna be like oh yeah i can go easily go up this trail i've been to so many spots last summer when i was scouting for that idaho deer hunt that film just came out and i scouted in the summer and i was like oh yeah this trail is going to save me so many miles it's actually a shorter trail i can get up in it then I started hiking down, and I was like, holy shit, no one's ever been down this fucking trail. <laughs> it is the <laughs> biggest hellhole ever. Worst trail ever. Worst trail ever. And I went way down <laughs> it and ended up cutting across and connecting to a different different trail to, like, actually save time. But it literally wasted so much of my time mm. going down it. But then I learned that this, you know, is an area I don't want to ever hike again. So, yeah, there could be little hidden pockets of animals down there. But it's like, if I'm going to hunt that spot, I have to access from a totally different area. You can't use that trail system. That trail system is overgrown, brushed out. Yep. You can barely find it. And it's like, that's that intel. Like, you wouldn't, if you just look on the map, you'd be like, oh, yeah, we're just going to go there on the hunt. But because I went there and scouted it and actually hiked down that trail, yeah, I figured it out. And that's why a lot of times, like, if I can go boots on the ground, I'm going to go in one way. And if I can, I'm going to go out a different way mm. so I can like, figure out, see you know, more country, see more country and just, you know, cross off other areas on the map that possibly have animals or I possibly can't access through there. Yeah. But again, it comes to, you know, you have to have boots on the ground. Cause like I said, that trail looked right. great on a map, but it was yeah. actually horrible. Absolutely horrible. That is one thing. Um, vegetation, right? That's one thing that always tricks me, right? Like I'll, I'll look at it on a aerial image, you know, map. And I think I can think of some late, elk hunts that I've done in Arizona and I think this is like the quintessential example of this I've looked at areas and I've been like this looks like a phenomenal area you know based on 
roads and access and where I think hunting pressure is going to come from, you know, based on habitat and water and feed and everything that I think an elk needs. And I'll look at it and I'll be like, yeah, that's the spot. And, and I've showed up and I've looked at that and it's like, <laughs> dude, it is a carpet. <laughs> Too <laughs> thick. It is, it is so much thicker than it looked, yeah. you know. That one's tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that one could be really hard, and I don't know how you know I don't know how you do that other than just you know combing maps and and like you said having having backup areas, right? Mm-hmm. What do you think is like to try to go boots on the ground? You draw through some tags. How early are you wanting to get out there to look at this? Let's say you have like a like mm-hmm. an archery elk hunt. Like when do you want it? When are you going to start doing your scouting if you can go boots on the ground? Sure, um, it's going to depend on the tag, like. I mean, for me, like this year, I have a Utah elk tag, right? Mm-hmm. And I know that that hunt opens August 20th, which is early for an archery mm-hmm. opener for elk. So for me, I feel like I have, you know, maybe a two-week window where I could potentially hunt and harvest a bull on summer range, you know, where they're still bachelored up. He might still be up where he spent June, July, right? Mm-hmm. So for me, <clears throat> I really want to see, you know, I want to see antler growth, right? Because I'm trying to maximize the potential of that permit. So I would say... You know, an elk, by the time, like, second week of, uh, you know, really the first week of July for a bull, you know, second mm-hmm. week for sure. And then by the end of July, I mean, you definitely know what a bull's going to look like, you know. Oh. And probably by that second week in August, they're going to be stripping velvet and, you know, it's it's go time. So I would say for elk, yeah, like um, that first week in July, I'm really itching to get out and get, get the eyes on, on some bulls. And then... You know, deer is a little bit later. I mean, I've looked at deer the first week of July and just thought, man, that buck's not going to be anything, you know, mm-hmm. and he's blown up in the last yep. couple of weeks of growth. So it's still nice to, like, get out there. I mean, I'm itching always, right? But yep. I would say really, like, that July 4th weekend, mm-hmm. I definitely am jonesing to get out and look. Yeah. What's your strategy right away? Are you trying to just, like, learn road systems, learn trail systems, mm-hmm. or are you just trying to dive in and try to put eyes on elk right away? Like, you know, you've never been into before, so what's your first step? Yeah, I think, like you, my first step is to learn the roads and trails, right? So you might have a road that you think you can get down with my forerunner. In reality, I need an ATV to get down yeah. that thing. So I'm looking at things like that, roads and trails. And a lot of that, I do a lot of driving just during the middle of the day, you mm-hmm. know, when I can't really do much else. I'm going to cover as much ground as I can with my vehicle. And then, you know, like if I roll into a unit, typically it's like I'll leave – you know, on a Thursday or Friday night after work late, I'll drive, I'll get there late, and I'll have in mind a glassing point that I want to hit. And this this is something we, we haven't talked about, but I certainly know we will, is, is glassing points, which yeah. I would say is probably the next step, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll have a glassing point pick, picked out that I think I can look over a lot of country that I think might hold elk, and I'm going to try to be there, you know, a half hour before light, and I'm going to hit that first thing in the morning. I may like comb some canyons in that area afterwards, you know, mid morning, maybe look for some water sources when I'm talking about elk. But then, um, yeah, midday I'm cruising road systems and just looking for access and I'm looking for other glassing points. That's kind of how I approach it. Mm-hmm. What about you, Brady? Do you just go into the 10 miles into your hell hole? Yeah, pretty much try to get as <laughs> head far as I can. Head into the hell, <laughs> head, more or yes. It, it kind of depends on what tag I have. Like some of these, you know, later season hunts, a lot of times I might – you know, seeing an animal is not like the goal of some of my scouting trips is mm-hmm. basically learning the country, learning, like I said, Did where I can access from. And then if that place just totally bonks and fails, I know I have a backup plan right away and how to get down it. And then do I need an ATV for that area? Mm-hmm. What, you know, what am I going to get into? But like a lot of times I'm just running the country trying to see all the terrain. And if it's a late season hunt, I want to know these animals are probably going to be migrating down into this like transitional zone. So what's that habitat look like for later season, a bunch of oak brush, sage brush, has the cover, has the feed type of thing. Like we're, what's going to hold deer during those later parts. And I'm even not even afraid of like getting in some timber and busting bucks. Like hmm. I don't think it, it matters a lot. If you bust some animals in the summer, they're going to be back by October, November, whatever your hunt is. So like, I'm not afraid to dive in there to see like where they're bedding at, where they're kind of hanging out. Obviously I don't want to like put too much pressure on them, mm-hmm. but I think you can actually go in there and get a little pressure on them and actually try to, you know, figure out their home little area where they do. And then if you do bump, bump a buck, where's he going to go when you put pressure on him? Like what's his little escape route? Because you can use that to your advantage too. Cause there's going to be other hunters there. Bucks are going to start running around getting pressured and how to use that to your advantage. But yeah, a lot of it's just learning country, learning out where the water sources are, mainly for me, not for the animals. It's, I need to be able to have the pack water up here. Am I going to go up in the summer? Like I've done some archery hunts before where I've stashed water in the summer mm-hmm. just to prepare myself for those 
Yeah. Know? Are you guys going to like general areas that you have picked out for me scouting? Yeah. Just would, to like maximize your time that yeah, you're out there. Yeah, for sure. Like I, I'm not headed out there blind by any means. Like I, I don't do nearly as much e-scouting as, as probably a lot of people do. Certainly not as much as Brady does or Brandon in the office. I know those guys spend a lot of time looking at, you know, maps and, and aerial imagery. You know, I'll pick out general areas and I'll pick out glassing points. And, and like I said, I want to hit those first thing, you know, first thing in the morning. And then, you know, before last light, I want to be on a glassing point looking over country and, and just kind of picking it apart. That's my preferred method. I mean, do you guys use trail cameras? What do you think about trail cameras? I don't use them. No. Don't use them at all? Mm-mm. Mm. I use well, them. Well, like here, <laughs> here, we live in Nevada, and mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm going to Wyoming, sure. know, you know, it's like. Feasible, not feasible. Yeah. 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 If a lot of this, a lot of the places I'm going, it's too far. And it's, even when I had some up in Utah, it's just a, a lot going back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't think it was worth it. Yeah, you'd rather like learn the country, glass it, figure out where you can glass from, than than diving in and putting mm -hmm. a trail camera up and then hoping there's an animal on it. You'd rather just lay eyes yeah. on an animal. Yeah. Do you use them? Would you use them if you? Is there a time that you would use trail cameras? Like if you had a deer tag, you know, here close. I would. You would use it. I'd probably use them. Yeah. I think it's. I think it's fun. I enjoy you know seeing animals, like mm -hmm. checking out their habits without them you know disturbing them and just. If, but if the, the, the effort of running trail cameras to me is just outstanding. Like it's a lot of gas money. It's a lot of time wasted. If I live close to it, like if yeah. I could go to it in thirty minutes, I think I think trail cameras are interesting, and I I, th I think they're more interesting, in my opinion, for for mule deer mm -hmm. or, or antelope even if, if you can. I mean, if you can get an antelope buck on a water source, and then you can use you know aerial imagery to pick apart a landscape and find out you know is that the only water source for that yeah. buck? You know, I think you stand a pretty reasonable chance of killing him on on that water source or close by. But like for mule deer, I I think trail cameras for mule deer are are very interesting and very effective, especially early. Like I think you've got a window from you know August if you have a bow hunt that starts like here does in Nevada on the 10th or, and you know, and it runs till, you know, early September, even October, like early October, if you've got some of those rifle hunts or muzzleloader hunts in different States, Utah's got a late, you know, muzzleloader hunt that mm -hmm. runs in September to October, man. I, it's interesting. I, I, I don't know, like using a trail camera, I don't really look at it necessarily as like a major time suck. Cause I might only check that thing one time. Like I may only roll in and check it in the end of, end of July, first week of August, you know, maybe twice if I can. But really, I mean, I feel like if I can get one photo, you know, of a buck and it's a buck that I want to harvest, especially if I have an early permit, man, I can just hone in on that area. And I feel like a lot of time those bigger bucks are so you know, habitual. I feel mm -hmm. like they're hold up. Cause then you're kind of working backwards and like, mm -hmm. all right, he's, he's there at that one point where then is he living around that area for them when your hunt comes, so you can glass you know, him up again. I've had really good success killing deer that I've had on trail camera. And I know, you know, we just had, you know, a big debate in Utah, right. About use of trail cameras. And, you know, we have a season now essentially, um, you know, and I heard a lot of people say, like, you know, I've never killed a buck that I had on trail camera. Or, you know, a trail camera never aided me in killing a buck. But, like, unequivocally, I can tell you that, like, I've killed bucks solely because I saw that deer on a trail camera. Mm -hmm. Like, it was the only reason I was really hunting that area. It wasn't like, you yeah. know, I would necessarily be hunting that area without that picture of that buck. And I think a lot of the times, like, a trail camera can give you that um, that persistence, like that hope. Yep, that boosts the confidence. That it's there. That it's there. Because, like, I, I killed – my biggest buck I killed, I had, you know, truck camera photos of it. Like, you know, I didn't see that buck when I was hunting him until the – you know, essentially until the, until the day I killed him. But, like, would I have given up on that buck had I not – have you know, it was there yeah, somewhere. No, and if I had not known, if I hadn't seen those trail camera photos in that area, I mean, that kept a lot of hope alive in the back of my head. Is it always water sources for trail camera, or you ever set one up on a trail, like a little saddle, like a little? I mean, back in U in Utah, you used to be able to, you know, throw out a salt block, right, yeah. or some, you know, buck jam or whatever that was. Yeah. And so I've used that quite a bit. Um, a lot of it I have used on water sources. Yeah, just. You know, and again, I don't think mule deer water all the time, and I think they can be pretty sporadic. I mean, I know deer in some areas that I hunt, they'll, you know, they'll travel four or five miles and hit a river in the middle of the night, you know, mm -hmm. and be back up to elevation to where, you know, I'm seeing them and hunting them in the day. So in that instance, it's not really that effective. But, yeah, I've, I've had some photos on water that helped. Hmm. Yeah, elk, I don't think it's that effective. Put it on a wallow. 
And then you I could mean, sit on the wall. <laughs> I mean, that that, that right. could be effective. I mean, during the rut, you know, I'd definitely but, tell you, like, if it's getting hit. But I just – elk are so – I feel like elk are so sporadic, yeah. man. They just roam around. I mean, it's – I would say it's pretty pretty dang tough to kill a bull that you were trail camming. Mm-hmm. But it does let you know what's in the area, at yeah. least early anyway. Yeah. So most of the scouting you're doing is for elk most of the time. Yeah. I mean, unless I have a deer tag yeah. in my pocket. And, and really – yeah, mostly elk. I mean, it'll be elk in Utah. Like I said, I've got that elk tag. Um, you know, antelope, if I got an antelope tag, if I can afford a weekend. I mean, I do love to antelope hunt. Right. You know, I may buzz out. And, and that's fun, too, because you just cover you, country, you right? Them, yeah, yeah you, you, you spend some time on Google Earth. Google Earth. Spend some time on Go Hunt Maps, and uh, you just pick out the water holes, you know, and, and you're cruising the roads and just glassing the adjacent areas to those. Right. So, uh, yeah. For elk, let's. what do you what do you – I know you mentioned you're like looking at glassy knobs and stuff and you're kind of driving around, but other than that, are you walking around the timber lot trying to find sign, old rut sign? Nope. No? No, I'm not. <laughs> trying to glass them up? Yeah. Like, especially early. Like if I have that hunt that opens the 20th, you know, or, the, or in August, uh, or even like the first week of September, if I can get out there and hunt and, and I've got some time to scout, like I'm mostly just glassing. Like I just want to see, you know, see bulls, see what's available. And then I'm, you know, if I've, like, for example, you and I, we have a tag in New Mexico, right? I don't know if we'll get down there or not. I hope we do. Um, and in that case, I think we'll mainly, my opinion, we'll, we'll just be kind of evaluating the landscape, yeah. right? But once those bulls start to rut, I mean, I'm I'm looking for areas that look elky. I'm mm-hmm. not necessarily right. looking for, for elk. And I I don't do a bunch of timber busta. No. You? No. I'm, I I just like to walk around. Basically, <laughs> I like to walk around and see, what, like, what looks good. Yeah. Like, if there's old rut sign, if there's rubs, if there's wallows. Like, you know, you're walking in a spot, you're like, there's definitely elk here, or there's going yeah, to wa- be elk here. Yeah, wallows for sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't put a ton of weight in, like, rubs. Maybe for whitetail. I I mean, elk, I'd, elk rub their antlers all year long. Like, they'll strip their velvet, and they'll rub their antlers all the way mm-hmm. through March, you know, when they shed. They'll just be walking around rubbing <laughs> trees. Right. So, I the mean, I, animals. yeah, I mean, you know, you might have some areas that seems like there's a lot of rubs and sure, maybe that indicates that like there's some, some more rut action. Uh, I would say if, if it's that type of area and you have other aspects of habitat, you know, water feed, and, and it looks like an area that you might have elk in September. Great. But like just to walk around, look at rubs, like I don't, I don't put too much weight in it. So if you can't put boots on the ground, what is your strategy then for kind of like e-scouting for an elk? Like if you guys can't go to New Mexico, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do to prepare yourself? What do you do, Nev? You've been hitting me up lately. I just look at spots that I think elk are gonna be. Yeah, just based on past <laughs> what does experience. That look like? North facing, some water, and some feed. Yeah, and then I mean, my style is a little bit similar to like yours. I don't like I like to be away from people. Yep, yeah. trying to get. And that's that's remote. not like we were talking about. It's not a like because there's elk there and there's not elk there. If they're close to the road or not, that's just kind of like what I prefer. Mm-hmm. It's still a style of hunting I like to do. Back country, get out there, away from people, mm-hmm. or try to get away from people, but that seems to be getting harder and harder every year. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It seems like there's a lot more people that are a lot more willing to head out deep, you know. And the gear we have nowadays is makes it easier to get back there. Like you have, you know, yeah. lightweight clothing, lightweight camp stuff. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I, I would say with, like, trail and I's all kind of styles, I was just, like, picking a spot, but then knowing – like not being afraid to leave that spot, not being afraid to move somewhere else to go somewhere else. Because I feel like a lot of people will go to a spot and there's not going to be elk there. There's not sign there. They just stay there. Stay They're just there. like, I'm just going to stay here and wait it out. How many times? Whereas I'm like, all right, if I don't see elk yeah. there or I don't hear anything, next, I'm out. I can think of at least three hunts that I've done in the last four years where I've ran into groups of people that were, you know, pack ins, which you know, great. I, I get it. You know what I mean? You want to get packed in by a horse and, and they're at a wall tent, but like they're parked there at their wall tent. Like yeah. they're there in the afternoon every single day. <laughs> and I haven't seen them more than, you know, maybe a half a mile from their wall tent. Like they just hang tight to that. Like I think of a hunt in Colorado where I ran into some guys and they were in a wall tent in a, in a drainage and the drainage looked great. You know, opening morning, me and my kid, we're backpacking and we're, you know, bare minimum, we're bivy hunting, right? And, uh, you know, I looked down into this big meadow, kind of a big open meadow. It's, you know, it's got some fingers of pine that run out into it. And there's like a group of guys, group of guys, group of guys. And they're hunting from, you know, two different drainages from two different wall tents, right? And I was telling my kid, I'm like, well, 
you know, there's too many people here. Elk aren't going to, you know, put up with that and feed out here anyway. Let's head up. We just turn. We head up. We probably hadn't gone a half a mile. Oh, bugle, bugle, bugle. And we just, the further we climbed, the deeper we got into this drainage. It was just like bull, 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 bull. I just, I felt bad for those guys that were just parked. Just yeah. stuck. Yeah. You, I, you have to be adaptable, right? right? If you want to kill, I yeah. feel like. Yeah, keep moving. Moving, moving, moving. Keep Pretty them doggies moving. Do you think it's uh, beneficial to do any summer scouting for like a late October, November type hunt? I think you can actually gain some benefit if you actually go out and put boots on the ground in some of those places. That's what I was going to say to you. So you're glassing up bulls in August. Mm-hmm. Like the chances of them being, let's say if you're doing a rut hunting, rut hunt in September, what are the chances? I mean, you know what I mean? They're not going to be in that same area. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll look for cow and calf herds, yeah. you know, because you know that those bulls are going to show up, right? So I'll look for big cow-calf groups and just kind of see where they're hanging out because that's generally where the feed's the best. And, you know, those cows are raising a calf, and it's a, a major cost, so they're looking for high-quality feed. And I think the bulls are going to, you know, start to cruise and look for cows. So I would say, yeah, I want to know where the cows and calves are for mid-September when, when they're starting to rut. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like – Look, you know, scouting early for late hunts, I think in that situation, you're not necessarily looking for an animal. You're, you're more evaluating a landscape when yep. you're out there on the ground. I mean, That's exactly the way I think. Yeah. I mean, for example, if you have a third season deer tag in Colorado, like how do you approach that if you have a weekend to run out in August? Yep. You're just running every single road you can, running down different trails to get to one glassing spot to see how it actually looks in person. And then maybe glassing it for that morning just to see what's there. But then I'm bouncing around to find other glassing areas to then mark down like, hey, this looks like I would expect a deer to be during third season in Colorado. I expect there to be a buck here because of mm-hmm. the way the habitat looks or, the, you know, maybe there's, you know, a bunch of does already hanging out there and no bucks there. Like, well, those does are, like you said, they're, they'll be there all year. The bucks are eventually going to come down to them to rut. And yeah. just trying to figure out exactly how to access it. So once that hunt happens, you're not wasting any time crossing off areas where there's no animals because that's the biggest thing like everything always looks good but like where is the higher like density of animals going to be what mm-hmm. is drawing those animals to that specific terrain and you can kind of figure that out a little bit in the summer just by bouncing around looking at stuff but yeah still kind of a crapshoot sometimes H- hidden within that there's something there's there's an underlying current there that i don't know if like people pick up on but when you say you're looking for for an area that a buck might be in third season, mm-hmm. you have to know what an area might yep. look like yep. where a buck would be third season, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So you've got to know some life history, right? Yep. You have, you have to, to know the biology, and that's what I always harp on. Like You always hear me talking about biology reports and different sort of habitat requirements of animals during certain times of year and you know what they need to survive. Like You can start to piece together that puzzle. Mm-hmm. and the more tools you add to your toolkit and like yeah you can read hunt stories all day long about how people hunt and do this but like biology is biology animals have to do things a certain way during certain times of year and you start to learn those pieces that make an animal tick whether it's a deer whether it's an antelope or it's an elk like you can start to figure out areas that are actually putting eyes on animals for like a later season hunt i've got all the time in you know august and September for October, late October, and even November hunts. Just mm-hmm. checking out areas I know will hold deer because of that habitat. Yeah. You're probably not seeing them then, right? No, nope, you're not. But I know they'll be there. Yeah, based on what you're you're looking at, the landscape, mm-hmm. vegetation. Yep. Yeah. Well, what's that kind of habitat look like for you when you see it? Like, oh, yeah, this is going to be a good spot. I want, you know, a lot of different ridge systems so I can know where I can glass from multiple angles. But I want timber, and I want I want timber for cover. And then I want like that edge habitat stuff where it's like, I know the feed's going to be really quality next to the timber. So these bucks aren't going to want to venture out in the open because once October hits, everything's all timbered up. Like these bucks become, you know, nocturnal, quote unquote. They're still there, but you just got to find areas to glass them when they're, you know, sitting in the timber. So it's like that little areas they have to get up and feed. They still feel comfortable to move, but yet they feel safe enough to, you know, move around in the timber, like, to find those little areas. And it's way different when you glass in the summer because you have all the leaves on the trees, everything. Once fall comes, you might have some snow on the ground. It's going to open up the doors to be able to glass in said timber to start picking them up. So it's just trying to find those glassing areas that allow you to see pockets where you think a, a buck might feel safe. And a lot of times that's, like, higher elevation areas. So I always harp on and people always make fun of me, but it's like I always go high right away because I want to I'd rather start high and work my way down because in the summer they're high. And then if I don't see them up there, I know I start bumping down the elevation bands or different, you know, levels of mm-hmm. their 
yearly activity what they have to go through and if they have all nutritional requirements they will still be in these areas where you probably saw them earlier in the year because they're animals they're not they're not going to just migrate for no reason right do you have hunts neville that you're stoked about like you're going to try to get out this summer and new mexico elk hopefully yeah me too i'm i'm pumped about that yeah you know another one i mean we drew we drew barbary sheep tags I'm yeah i would love to run down there how are you guys yeah. going to scout that they got to be doing the same thing, same thing all year right? round don't they I mean, besides I when they get so. pressure. Yeah, I mean, given that habitat, I mean, it's they, they have a habitat down there, right? I mean, it's rocky, craggy, nasty country. And, I mean, you know, maybe midsummer they seek out more shade, I would maybe. I mean, they're obviously a, a, a drought, <laughs> you right. know, a hot temperature, tolerant animal. But I would love to run down there and just spend some time glassing. Like, I'm I'm pumped about seeing one of those. I don't know. That's This is a prime example. I don't know enough about that animal yeah. at no. this point to be like, but right. you're, probably, you're probably going to start, though, like yeah. trying to start you yeah. know, whatever you can find on the Internet. Maybe you can For pick sure. up a book. Like. That brings up a question. Let me ask you, how much t- how much effort do you guys put into, like, talking to other people? Like, f- looking at forums, looking at, oh, you know, I do. looking at uh, Instagram, social media posts, reaching out to friends and family that may have hunted in the general area. Like, do you guys put weight in that? Do you mm. do a lot of that? I nope. do. I don't. I do. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do too. I try to reach out as many people I know. Hey, have you been in this area? What do you think about this area? Mm-hmm. Have you ever called a biologist? I have. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I have. Have you never? I you never have. You never have. Never talked to anyone. Yeah, I have. I and I get <laughs> that's <laughs> <laughs> talk to anyone. I love that. But you just you just don't want them to know. Yeah. You can call them up and give them a false name. I know. I need to get like a burner burner the phone. Burner phone. Different, then different number. <laughs> then they would check your tag and be like, oh, this guy doesn't have a tag. The only time I've ever talked to people is while I'm out there hunting or if I run into, you know, a like Montana random like check station or something like that. I might, mm-hmm. you know, talk to the guy like, hey, you know, we're out here hunting. You know, do you guys, where are you guys seeing animals? And then I'll remember that for the following year or that hunt that I'm on right now. But mm-hmm. I've never called the biologist up or talked to a game warden or yeah, I any of that. And maybe, maybe that's, you know. I should add to that part of my toolkit, but it's something I've never done. I hate talking on the phone. Mm-hmm. So it's just, and I always feel worried, like, am I bothering this person? They're probably getting hounded. They're giving out the same information to every single person. So it's like where in that is the truth of where some, like, hidden information might be. And to me, I have a hard time, like, believing people. That's not a lot of trust in the human race. That's, that is one thing. If I feel like you do, def- you definitely have to take it w- with a grain of salt. Like you have to, you know, if you're given a piece of information by someone, you have to, you know, gauge your relationship with them. And, you know, mm-hmm. if I ask you, Brady, I don't feel like I'm going to get, <laughs> I no. mean, you, I might because, you yeah. know, we're friends, <laughs> but like, but I think you might get better information if you've already done your homework ahead of time and know the right. unit and be like, Hey, I've been looking at this ridge or this, this Creek or this <laughs> yeah. area rather than saying, Hey, I drew a tag here. Like, Tell me what the biggest deer are. Yeah. That, that's the point. I was going to ask Neville, when you call a biologist, like, what do you do? How do you address that? I say, where are the animals? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Give me the bulls. Okay. A lot of them, it's more access questions. Yeah. Like, uh, is this road closed? How do, is this an accessible spot? It's not, I wouldn't, I don't ask too much about like where, where the animals are themselves, but more about like roads and access. I, I would be interested. To, year. I'd be interested to know like pressure. Like, hey, do you know? Can you tell me where all the outfitters kind of are, so I know mm-hmm. like where pressure might be? Like, the outfitter camps are like pretty much the same every single year. Yep. And I think you have to register them, but it's like it that's depends. information you probably could uh, get from you know a biologist. Be like, oh yeah, Joe Blow hunts up here all the time, and yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I can think of times when I've asked biologists, you know, where are the access points? And, and they've told me, you know, these are your two primary access points. But, you know, don't go to that one. Go to this one. This one gets you, you know, a better, you know, straight shot into a country that will probably have elk in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's been really helpful. I mean, I, you know, I worked for Game and Fish. And even now, I guarantee you, Brady, that you get DMs. Mm-hmm. Like All the time. I, I, had, I had, I think, three emails on the way down today as I was driving. Just checked that people had drawn tags and were like, hey drew this tag what do you think you know um are you more likely to give people any information if they approach it in a certain way if they approach it in a certain way if they're asking about a specific unit asking if i've hunted there before obviously i have to you know work around that a little bit but i'll give people general advice on just biology about animals where i might go but i'm never going to like pull up my computer actually dive into it give them an exact spot because Mm -hmm. i don't know i don't don't really like, do that yeah and just, that's not my style but that will mm-hmm. give general advice for sure yeah i was gonna say I, i'm typically like if somebody comes to me 
and they, you know, either they call me or they reach out via email. Like if, if they've done homework, mm-hmm. like if they've picked out trailheads, if they've done, you know, the legwork as much, I feel like as far as they can take it and they're just looking for like, you know, maybe some tips and tactics. Like I'm much more open to those types of people yep. than I am to, to just somebody that says, Hey, I drew a blah, blah, blah tag. What do you, where should, where I, should I go? I go? No. I'm like, I don't know. You know, I mean, I do, but I'm not going to just like outright, right. you know, yeah. say it. Like if someone knew I drew like the most coveted deer tag, that's mm-hmm. going to take you 20 years to draw. Sure. I'd be more inclined to give some information if they're like, Oh, I heard you had this tag before from so-and-so like, can you give me some information? I'd, I'd help that person out, mm-hmm. but it's like, when, when is that really going to happen? I haven't drawn like yeah. I've only drawn one really coveted tag in my life, and that does kind of vary too. What kind of tag you have? Mm-hmm. If it's a general season, it's an easy tag to draw. People are are generally pretty tight lipped about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I would encourage you to reach out to people, man. I, some of the best information I've ever got was from people. You'd be surprised how much people are not like you, and they just will give yeah. you like their favorite spot. Like is, is, it, is it better to get on the phone like a game warden, a biologist? Like who who do you really want to talk to? Taxidermist in the local town? Do you want to call up those people? Like, I mean, if you can get a taxidermist in, a t- in some town to open their mouth, like you stop into their shop and just say, hey, you know, I've got a tag for this unit. If I kill a nice buck or bull, you know, are you taking, you know, heads or whatever and just start a conversation? I mean, it seems like taxidermists are a wealth of information because people <laughs> already had succeeded, took a big animal there's and they go there and they just open up everything. There's nobody more willing to talk than somebody who's just killed an animal and brought yeah. it to a taxidermist. Like they will tell you any. <laughs> <laughs> I was right here, right <laughs> this time of day. They're so jacked. They want to tell you absolutely anything. And I'm not saying to take advantage of the types of people, but they will definitely spill the beans. Yeah, for, for sure. Taxidermists are great. You know, I think, uh, you know, like butchers are good. You know, if you can call up a butcher again, working under the same premise that, hey, if I kill an animal, are you taking meat? You know, can I bring it by? Um, you know, where are people hunting, you know? Just yeah, you just might never know. Mm-hmm. But you're asking him a specific question, and then you're leading into something else. So yeah. it's not. So you are benefiting him by, he's like, yeah, I want to take my meat to you if I kill something. And while I, I got know. you on the phone, I just thought I might pick your brain a little bit. Sure. Like, working it that way. Yeah, and the other thing I would say is, like, if you're willing to ask people for information, you also need to be willing to give information. Mm-hmm. So, like, I try to... You know, if I reach out to somebody and they give me some intel, I try to return the favor, at, at, yeah. you know, any time that I possibly can. I yeah, feel like that's, that's really a, good. maybe that's karma. It's like one of those like karma. 100 code things. Like if yeah. you, they help you, you got to help them. Yeah. So. I feel like that's bad karma if you just take and don't give back. And I feel for the, for the most part, like these people, they're, give, they're not ever really giving you like exact spots. Mm-hmm. They're giving you general area. And it's like, all right, now you have to go kind of figure like it out. You got to figure it out yourself. Like mm-hmm. this, this is a good start for you mm-hmm. and you'll get into them or, but most of the time it's like yeah. kind of have to figure out yourself once you get to that yeah. spot. One of the only times I ever asked someone information was when I was on a scouting trip in Nevada. I actually ran into a sheep herder guy. Oh man. They mm-hmm. got so, oh and Just my living gosh. out there. He was a wealth of information. Super excited to sit down and talk. Yep. We had a conversation <laughs> for a long time. You know, he told me where his camp was. Oh, if you're bored, come on over and, those guys so are I came over and we are. chatted, and that was really good information. Yeah, on scouting trips, I try to go to the local bar and see how drunk I can get. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to everyone. <laughs> yeah, I got a buddy that speaks Spanish. And he'll oh, that'd be, that, a, that'd be so great. Like, yeah. if he runs into some of these, uh, you know, sheep herders that only speak Spanish, and those guys are living the entire summer out there yeah. with, you know, with their sheep, and they're moving those herds continuously across the landscape. Like, you can open up and talk to those guys. I've had, I've had friends just gain tons of information from sheep herders that are mm-hmm. out there. All the time. Yeah, I bet. Going back to e like going back to scouting, like e you know, internet scouting. Are there other tools that you look at? I mean, what else do you look at within those? I mean, I always harp on our elevation band tool. Like if I have an early season hunt, I want to you know look at ten thousand to eleven thousand five hundred feet and start narrowing down some of those like elevation bands where I might want to consider if I had an archery hunt. Or later season hunt, I might look 10,000 to 8,500 feet, depending on the unit, obviously. Mm-hmm. But look at that a lot. I look at, you know, data that I collected previously on previous hunts. Do you ever look back on, like, oh, I had I had this unit, killed an animal here. Do you ever, like I always say, like when I do the training also to like extrapolate all that data mm-hmm. and incorporate that into a new unit. Do you ever look back on previous stuff? Like, hey, this animal was here. This is similar terrain. 
to this unit, I might be able to take it into my new hunt now or like where you found elk before, you can kind of use that to your advantage. Trill doesn't do enough waypoints for that. I know. That's what I'm, I'm talking to. A, <laughs> he like puts a, down one waypoint. Like a blank stare here. <laughs> uh, I, I would say to some extent, but I'm not going to – not not nearly as satisfying as, as, as I feel like I want to give you. I want to say yes real bad, but the truth is I, I, I'm i not great at that. Do you think elk are easier to find than deer? For sure. Way easier. They're like a giant yellow school bus. I mean, they're but, e- but even like e-scouting, do you think it's easier to e-scout for elk yes, than it's for deer? I, do. I think so too. I, I, mean, think, yeah, I mean, all you're looking for feed water and bedding i mean you could say the same thing for mule right. deer but i mean here's the thing i feel like elk i mean elk are you know they're tied to water like yeah. not maybe not as bad as an antelope but but elk need water every single day and they can cover a lot of ground and they might hit you know a couple different drainages but like if it's got a big especially early north facing you know good timbered slope good shade especially if you got some benches with some water and some you know some wallows mm-hmm. and then that kind of thing i mean there's probably going to be some elk there right, right? whereas I, c- I can think just off the top of my head i can think of some areas that should have mule deer in it that yeah, don't that don't and i can think of some areas that probably shouldn't have mule deer that do yeah so, so i feel like they're you know they're much more you know, they're more specialized, if you will. I mean, mm-hmm. their, their diet's more specialized, right? The things that they eat is much more specialized than, a, than an elk, which is just a generalist. They can eat everything. Yeah. So if you have a, if the elk are so easy to e-scout for in a way, what if you have a unit that has a ton of awesome-looking north-facing slopes, great water, great feed? How are you going to determine what's your A spot, B spot, and C spot just based on e-scouting? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, same things, types of mosaics, you know what I mean? I'm looking for, and, and at that point I am probably starting to evaluate, uh, pressure because yeah. Yeah. I think pressure is a major contributor to, you know, where elk are going to be once a hunt opens because elk, I mean, they know they, they may be 10 miles in because people aren't willing to go there. They may be two miles in because people are going past them, but mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a little nook and a cranny, right. But they definitely don't like pressure. I know that. So that's probably that'd probably be my answer to that question is like, I'm, I'm evaluating it from a pressure perspective. Like mm-hmm. where are elk going to go to find refuge? Mm-hmm. I, I would say. Did you ever in elk hunting, like looking at those like public private boundary areas, mm-hmm. like trying to navigate that, like, Oh, these elk, all the feed and water might be on private. So you're going to hunt that public border. You ever kind of I can't, doing I can, that? Yeah. I can't say that. I can't think off the top of my head of an area um, where I've done that, like where I focused on it, but it's, I know, you know, people that hunt in Montana, people yep. that hunt in Wyoming, you know, for sure people are doing that yep. and, and should, in, mm-hmm. in my opinion. I mean, you should evaluate every advantage that you can possibly get. And if there is refuge on private land and there's feed, but it's in adjacent to public and those elk are going to bleed in and out of private and public, I would absolutely exploit that provided it's, it's legal, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and you can access it. But yeah, I would, I would definitely say that's something you should consider. Cause I always feel sure. like a lot of times those are like little hidden pockets are kind of overlooked by people. Sure. Cause again, it might be really close to a trail or really close to a road, but mm-hmm. it has that perfect habitat on private and they definitely bleed over onto public to go bed or whatever. That's where all their cover is. Yeah. And so you can use that to your advantage and get into some of these spots and trying to e-scout that way. Like, hey, people are going to overlook this. Really could be great. Yeah, you might not see a lot of animals. You could be waiting there a long time for animals yeah. to cross, but could open the door to a lot of good benefit. I feel like that can get tricky. Like if you're hunting an area that, that's like that, I would say for me at least it would be kind of a – it would probably be on the lower end of my plans because I don't I don't like playing the public private game. I don't want to be reliant on that animal coming back across onto public, you know, and me yep. being in the right position at the right time. I just I don't like playing that game. So I mean it would have to be, you know, either it was the only place that I had to hunt really or there was like some real special animal that I was like <laughs> I was gonna say or there's a giant. Yeah, or there's a giant. <laughs> yeah. And then I I probably would. I would live right there. Because to me it's like on some of my late hunts that I always take my family on in Montana, that late deer hunt, mm-hmm. like we utilize that strategy yeah. a lot. Cause the deer are rutting. They're constantly moving. We watch one buck, one spot. He's four miles away the next day. And it's like, he's moving so much, but there's a little pockets that people just aren't willing to go out and walk to get to these other further areas that are more remote, but you're navigating the private, staying on public the whole time and getting further and further in there. There's maybe this little two square mile area that is absolute gold. That's just, yeah. waiting to be tapped into that you can't access from any other way unless you do long you know death hikes to get into there but a, a, again within that like you said something key there it's the fact that you're hunting deer that are 
rutting. Yep, rutting. You have a reason, reason to, to believe that potentially that buck may move. You mm-hmm. know, he may follow some does out where he probably won't in September. Right? Yep. He may just hang tight and be happy as be, happy as a clam. Yeah, and in the private the whole time. Yeah, I remember. I mean, I remember a hunt in Colorado it was a third season hunt, and there was a giant buck in a field. I mean, just an absolute slob. You know, two two hundred plus and. You know, I hunted that buck three days, and when I say hunted, I meant I hung out on public land <laughs> and watched him in that, and watched him in the field. In the off chance that that buck would follow a hot doe out of that field, and I had one morning where it almost came to fruition. I mean, he lined out six does and headed out, and he was all but there, and then got to a point where I was like, "Nope, not going to do it." Turn around, he came back out. Another four point in the field was chasing does. He followed him out, did exactly what I hoped he did, and I hammered him because I was just frustrated at that time. <laughs> I'm like, that's it. You're getting it. You know Done what I mean? Done for. But, th- but that's another, you know, that's another thing. That's another bio, you know, biological thing. That's another a- animal behavior that you, you can exploit given that time of the year yep. and, and that vulnerability of an animal, you know. So you you got to kind of know those, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you ever had, like, a total e-scouting bust? Oh, yeah. Like, looks so perfect. Everything and about nothing. that. There's just absolutely nothing in there. Yeah. What do you take away from that? Just the, that I suck. <laughs> this place is just an area that just never might never have an animal, or <laughs> did someone kill it before you get there, Could or be. just doesn't have animal during that time of year? Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah. I, and, it, it, like, hopefully you didn't put all your eggs in one basket, but, like, mm-hmm. kind of heartbreaking when that happens because it happens to everyone. It's happened to me. It's like. Yeah. You just. I can't think any – I'm trying to think. I know so this has happened to me on antelope hunts. Like, I've I've looked over areas that look exactly like other areas, and there's antelope in this one, but there's no antelope in this one. Yeah. You know, I've spent a day or half a day driving around an area and seeing, like, maybe one or two antelope. I'll move to a, an adjacent area that I – you know, another canyon, another big draw, and there seems to be antelope everywhere. Mm-hmm. So I definitely had that happen there, and it – you know, I guess you what, – what you, I guess at that point, like if I were smart, I would, you know, pull out my field notebook and I would start making notes of what I'm seeing, right? Like, what am I seeing on the ground? Am I seeing, you know, certain types of vegetation, you know, that's maybe lacking in the other mm-hmm. area? So if I, if okay. I was smart, that's Gotta what I would start doing that. Because right? <laughs> I've ran into that before a lot, like, especially in Utah, like all the terrain looks exactly the same. Yeah. All the feeds exactly mm-hmm. the same. I might be seeing does everywhere, but I'm like, there's no bucks here. Go to the next little area. There's no bucks here. But then you finally find that one spot looks exactly the same as the three other spots I was in, and boom, here's bucks. It is weird, isn't it? It's just like, what is going on here? What am I missing? Like, mm-hmm. right. where where did I go wrong? I feel like deer, like deer, are definitely more prone to that type of stuff. I've I've killed deer in areas just like you're saying, where it's it's a head scratcher. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, why why this spot? You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it boils down to you have to take care of their, you know, their their biological needs, feed, water, and cover. But then I also think there's something else there within that that they're using to exploit, and it's probably pressure, right? Yeah. They've found a niche where it's getting overlooked, and it's either mm-hmm. because people are going, you know, too high or, you know, too low or just driving through. Yeah. But, yeah, you, that's the funny thing about scouting, right, whether you're e-scouting or you're scouting on the ground, like – it doesn't, it, it, there's so much that's encompassed in it. Like yeah. you, you have to look at this at a much bigger picture than just feed water and cover. Right. Yeah. There's even, you know, I know there's I've read stuff on like elk back in the day. Like there's certain slopes that elk will type, mm-hmm. like prefer, like the degree mm-hmm. of the yeah, slope de- mm-hmm. where it starts benching off. You might see a little more elk, but like, it's just crazy. Like we're talking about biology a lot, but it's like you start to dive into that. You learn those little hidden gems and yeah, that's kind of the core of it. Right. Do you ever, uh, pay attention to any of those like grazing allotments i don't like when you're e-scouting like where the cattle might be on and they're gonna, I wish they're gonna I pull because i hate seeing them <laughs> <laughs> i know people will definitely pay attention to sheep mm-hmm. because it just doesn't seem like sheep and and wildlife mix yeah. so mule deer elk and sheep just don't seem to hang out in the same spot so i definitely know guys will check you know sheep allotments but they do seem like they move them across the landscape, and you know I have seen I have seen them together. But yeah, I, I know people that will look at sheep There's a lot. Much. Nothing more frustrating than hunting a spot and have a bunch of sheep in it and yeah. those noisy dogs and oh yeah, those big white cur dogs. Man. Oh, it's they hate me. They're they mean. Chase me, <laughs> they chase me down and bark yeah. at me. I'm sitting there glassing. Do you use like fire layers, migration corridor layers on e 
internet mapping? I use those a lot, especially the, where the migration and public land start to meet. You know, obviously it's not a direct science of like they're going to be in that same spot because they could have a canyon over and it might not be mapped correctly. But like, that's a great starting point. Hmm. If you're just e-scouting and want to check it out, like where that migration, where the public and where maybe that private that might have the feed, because eventually they might, you know, work their way down in the private when it gets later in the season. I'm going to take note of that for sure. How can I get into those spots? Why is that spot special? Why does it seem special on a map? Why is that a migration area for those deer? Is because that's the easy access point out of the mountains down in their their winter range. Mm-hmm. And that could be then where they're going to rut. So you do look at them? You do look at them a lot. Neville, do you look at burn layers? Oh, fire layers for sure. Fire yeah. layers are awesome. <laughs> My God, those are gold mines. The but thing, though, with that is where it's good to go do, like, some feet on the ground. Mm-hmm. just to see how thick that fire's gotten since, like, the burn. Yeah. Like, if it's so thick, like, you can't you even can't hunt it. You can't walk through it. Elk love it. I know yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I, first first big bull I ever shot, I shot out of a, out of an area that was a fire, you know, burn layer, burn scar. And, I mean, ve- vegetation was so thick. That aspen was dog hair. That's what I call it, dog hair aspen, because you're, you're wading through it, you know? Mm-hmm. I remember actually one one time hunting that area, and I was standing up on this big rock that was in that aspen. And that aspen was probably six to eight feet tall, and I had uh, a herd of cows and calves and a bull, probably like a three thirty bull, pushing them. And it looked like you know that movie Tremors. Yep. That's what it looked like. It looked like a the, just the, the aspen moving, just like just yeah, just folding as those cows and that bull came through. I mean, I I could have. I couldn't have not shot that bull. Like, if that bull would have walked by at five yards, I couldn't have shot it. It was so thick. Hmm. And he could have in that vegetation. It was just so thick. He was headed to a bench. And just like you're saying, like, there was a pocket, which I eventually killed a bull in, just kind of, you know, to the east of that. But, um, yeah, it had some open meadows and stuff. But I re- that was a funny one. I remember that, like, oh, this is like that movie Tremors, you know, this elk just, like, wading through this yeah. dog hair aspen. But burns, burns are interesting. I had a conversation the other day with a guy that said uh, – He's like, I don't pay. Everybody talks about burns. Everybody talks about burns. He's like, I just, I'm, I'm. He didn't say I'm over it, but it was kind of in, in essence, it was like I'm kind of over, you know, the burn layer. I'm really? Just, yeah, I don't. Everybody's gonna go to the burn. Do you think that's true? No, because burns are nasty <laughs> to hike through, so it's a barrier that is of entry. True. Deadfall. Deadfall is horrible. Hell. But the animals are there, so why not utilize it? That's new growth. That's unless you get to the point where it's that dog hair shit. But it's like. You Still can be animals. I mean, there's animal, there were animals there. It can be tough to hunt, but yeah, I thought that was interesting. You know, he was huh. basically just saying, you know, I think everybody's going to flock to the burn. They're going to pull up the burn layer. You know, they're going to look to those burns that are, you know, how old's a burn? Like, when do you give up on a burn? A couple of years, two years, three years. Is that, I would say, I would say they're most productive, like maybe years three, four, five, six. You get to like 10, 11, 12. Maybe you're starting to peter out on some mm-hmm. of the benefits, but. Yeah, I don't know. I was really surprised, kind of, because I I do. I mean, I look at those for sure, especially for elk. I feel like it's yeah. a, it's a it's an ice cream shop for elk in a lot of cases, if what, you have the right other factors. What about another like hidden layer that I don't think a lot of people utilize, but you probably could to get away from people, is a map of grizzly bear activity where grizzlies are kind of at. Can you use that to your advantage? I when you're, especially when you're like elk hunting or deer hunting to go into these places where mm-hmm. known grizzlies it definitely will scare people away i know that i know it keeps people away like do, you think, do you think oh it definitely yeah. keeps people yeah. away for <laughs> sure maybe not in mass i mean it, it'll keep a, f- a fair number of people away a fair number of people do not want to mix with a grizzly they just don't want the opportunity so for if you pulled any, up a map kind of they might encounter. just completely avoid it even though there might not even be any grizzlies there yeah just because the map shows there is yeah the potential right potential. i mean yeah, and I mean, it's, I understand it. I mean, grizzly bears are, they could be terrifying. It would deter me. I mean, I don't, I'm not too wound up about it. I would still hunt so it. So you would still e scout it and still maybe For plan sure. on going in there and just take the precautions? Yeah, you can. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I apply in an area every year, you know, that typically has a leftover tag that, uh, you know, goes into the leftover draw that's just lousy with grizzlies, and I apply for it every year, and they kill some great bulls out of that country, and I, I think it's just, you know, people don't want to mess with it. Yeah. So I would say it depends on your level of comfort, right? But I, mm-hmm. I mean, I wouldn't overlook it. There's still elk in there. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is most important or more important? E scouting or feet on the ground? You asking me? Both of you. <laughs> I'll, Trump, Trump you want me go, go first? first? Yeah. I would say boots on the ground. And it's just because I'm not a great e scouter. I could be a better e scouter. I, I learn. 
I'm a whole lot more effective. I feel like if I can just get even a weekend on the ground, driving the unit, you know, if I can get, you know, two mornings and two evenings glassing, um, I feel like I am a lot more comfortable than I am just heading into an area when I've spent a lot of time e-scouting. Mm-hmm. That's just me. Brady? I go both ways. I think if you just want any sort of animal, don't care about age, don't care about size, you're just out there looking for an adventure and want to take whatever animal you see, I think he's going to be a great tool for that. But if you're trying to hone in on a big, mature animal, mm-hmm. really want to learn it, really want to figure it out, it's an area you can maybe hunt multiple times, I think boots on the ground is definitely the way to go. Like I said, you're going to learn the trail system, you're going to learn habits, you're going to learn everything while you're out there, glassing points, way more than you can e-scouting. But if you start to learn the biology, how to manipulate e-scouting tools to benefit you, you can get close to what you could boots on the ground, but you're never going to replace boots on the ground. Yeah. But I think that's what we're running into now with gas prices. Ooh. How are we able Whoa. to go e-scouting? Because <laughs> I went, I was in Idaho, what, twice last year for, e- for boots on the ground scouting. Drove all the way up there. And yeah. I'm not going to be able to afford to do that this year. Yeah, that's I have to pick my, pick my poison. Penny. What am I going to scout? Yeah, I filled my Forerunner up today. I'd come down here. It was 89 bucks, yeah. which is double what it was you know you guys got that cheap gas in utah (laughs) (laughs) welcome to vegas yeah no kidding i bet you guys are five bucks over five it's got to be like 520 i bet so it's like that's going to become a big player in maybe if you save a bunch of coins start selling stuff start working a second job so you can afford to go e-scouting start doing some chores for your neighbor like if you can afford to go e-scouting or not boots on the ground scouting like Mm -hmm. during Mm -hmm. these times you might have a leg up on everyone else i think you have to do both you definitely do. I think you definitely have to do both. I just feel I feel a whole lot better if I've had some boots on the ground. Right. If yep. I've driven the roads, if I've looked at the landscape, if I kind of mental, mentally prepared myself for what I've got, I've gotten myself into. I, I feel a lot better and a lot more effective. Right. If I, even if a, a weekend. Yeah, they both they both lend off one another in some mm-hmm. sort of way. Yeah, they can, you confirm right. You right. confirm your suspicions. Because you this is a good story then to bring up about the importance of boots on the ground. So a couple of years ago. My brother and his friend wanted to go to a state and go hunting. They picked up the tags. I gave them a few ideas, started e-scouting it with them, gave them a bunch of waypoints. I've never been there myself. And then they show up, and that place that we were talking about them going into, driving their vehicle, parking it, and accessing this mountain range, and it being a spot that there was two giant boulders in front of it, no markings anywhere on any sort of mapping thing back in the day that this was ATV only. Hmm. They got there and they couldn't access any of the stuff. And that was, they put all their eggs in that one basket. Like that's the place they wanted to go. Cause it looked so great. They got hosed because they didn't put any, it was like too far for them. They live in Minnesota. They're going out to the state. They could not yeah. do any boots on the ground scouting. And so they then turn around, go on Craigslist, found an ATV for sale <laughs> on Craigslist, bought an ATV when no they were out way. there so that they could access it to go hunting. And then they end up turning around and peddling that ATV when they got back to Minnesota and made more money off it. But to have that thought in their head, like, we need this because it's there we want to go. And they got sick of walking down it and there were the guys ride horseback and they had guys sure. going ATV past them. And like, what are you guys doing? Like, oh, we're hiking. Like, you guys are idiots. <laughs> and that's so, crazy. like, that's why the importance of boots on the ground scouting or getting some intel or maybe, again, picking up the phone call and calling someone that I never do would have been beneficial. Yeah. They're like, hey, can we actually access this? This is an access point. Scouting season's like one of my favorite seasons. Like I, I think back on the hunting that I've done, probably the most satisfying hunts I've ever had have been when I put a lot of time and a lot of effort into summer scouting and then mm-hmm. I've actually harvested an animal that I scouted. Like n- nothing feels like that. Like yep. you, you can't do that all the time and you have to take, you know, like you're saying, gas prices, travel, you know, your proximity to the area that you're hunting. But Man, there's nothing like that. And I would say that consistently the guys that I know that produce year in and year out, like the biggest difference is time and, yep. and scouting. It's it's key. Like, you know, if you want to do well, I think you can still do well. You know, I think you and I are gonna do great, you know, even That's if we, right. we don't <laughs> even if we don't get time to run down there, which, you know, God willing we will, right? But um I, th- that's the biggest difference, I think. It's yeah. just boots on the ground, getting out there and just hammering it. Yeah, that's why I loved back in the day, like when I took one of my archery bucks. Like I scouted that buck all summer, mm-hmm. Went up there multiple times, killed him on day four. Nothing Be- like it because I had all the homework done ahead of time. I knew exactly where that buck lived, where he fed, where he bedded, like 
exactly everything and killed them on day four. Yeah. Just the coolest thing ever when you can actually scout a buck all summer and then kill that buck right away. It feels I'm, really, really cool. When I was and you have all that history with him. Like that deer yeah. just becomes a part of you. All you do is think about him because you know what he's doing every single day. You're like, man, what are we doing on, on this Saturday? Well, I know what he's <laughs> doing because I was just there last week and he's doing the same exact thing. Mm-hmm, Got yeah. him patterned so well and you go up there and just kill him. Yeah, when I was I went to the the Colorado, we did this Colorado Youth Outdoors seminar, and I, I you know spoke for twenty minutes or whatever. And we had somebody ask a question like, "How do you kill the biggest buck? You know, how do you kill the biggest buck of your lifetime, or where do you where do you kill the biggest buck of your life?" And you know, my answer to him was, "Is the area, the area close to home and the area that you know?" Yeah. And, and I really believe that. I mean, I don't care. You know, obviously, it has to have some elements of like being able to produce a kind you know that kind of buck that you're after, but like. I think your best bet to kill a big deer or a big buck, you know, big buck or big bull is, is an area that, you know, that's close to home. And the more time, if, at least for me, like the more time I've spent, it's a direct correlation between success so on, on the animal. Scout hard, hunt easy. Yes. I've always said hunting, all the hunting's done preseason opening days for killing. Yep. Mm. For me, I mean, that's, the best bucks I've ever killed, I've killed on opening day, typically. And it's because I've done all my homework up to it. I mean, I get, I've get i had some deer that I've just got obsessed with. Like, I've told Neville before. Like, I've, I remember I told my wife one time. I remember, like, hey, this buck is – this is a special buck. Like, I'm I'm living – I'm going to move in with this deer. Like, he and I are going to yeah. hang out. That's such a cool story. <laughs> like, we're moving in together. I'm, I'm moving in up there with him, and I'm just going to live with him, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, it's crazy, too, to think, like, even when you do one – one scouting trip, how much you learn from just one time. Oh, man, you feel and it, <laughs> so good, huh? And if you can do that maybe three more times, four more times, like how much better yeah. that'll be. What, yeah. do you, what do you do when you go on a scouting trip and come back? Do you uh, analyze a bunch of photos you might have taken on your phone? Are you just kind of just piecing it all in your head? Are you recording anything? Because I know for me, I take just photos of everything, mm-hmm. photos of the terrain, photos of these basins I think look cool, and then I just like look at them later and – yeah, Are you taking I'm, anything I'm, away? Yeah, taking notes. I'm not like I said. I'm not a great note taker, but I'll take notes of you know areas that I thought looked good, even if I didn't see an animal. If I saw an animal that I want to you know kill, I'm definitely taking notes and I'm yeah. looking at that area. Or you might have got to one glass and I'm like, dang, that spot way over there mm-hmm. looks really killer. And you might have had a photo of it to look back on, and start zooming in, and pull it up on the computer, look at yeah. it, and go on maps later. One of my favorite things to do is if I see an animal, like if I see a buck or a bull, and that's you know an animal I really want to target. Um, I'll really start to pick apart that, that pocket. Yeah. Like I will really, really fine tune, you know, go that through that area with a fine tooth comb. And I want to know every seep, every spring, every patch of timber. I want to know all the canyons and drainages that feed off of it. I want to know every single glassing point within that proximity. And, and I spend a lot of time doing that. Yeah. Yeah. What about you now? Just got to find them first, right? How's it? How's I was, you've killed some big white tail. How does it differ? What, what do you do? Um, what I'd do you say it's pretty similar to like how you do run trail cameras in Utah. Is yeah, that so about you, the only option? Uh, you have summer scouting where you can find them in like bean fields, where you can you'll see them, but their summer patterns are going to be different. Have you ever scouted a buck that you killed? Oh like, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. got them on like trail cameras. Okay, but like but, yeah, watching them, I would assume like you're probably hunting them in November, right? And they're yeah. Rutting. Yeah. So you'll find deer. Obviously, like in the summer, they'll be in bean fields. They're hitting bean until they turn brown, then they switch over to corn. But then, like, their summer patterns can be way different. Mm Because then, depending on the state, like Iowa, your opening day is not until October 1st. And usually by then, that buck's going to be completely nocturnal. Like, Mm. he won't won't be out in the daylight ever. Hate it. He'll he'll be out in the bean field (laughs) all summer long, munching, and then once October hits, he's just hunkered down. Huh. But, yeah, a lot of it's just usually trail cameras are huge for whitetail hunters figuring out where they're at and then you're basically doing that same thing where you you got a picture of it and then you're picking out where did it come from where's it going where's the feed where's its bed and then usually it'll be you within that vicinity that it'll live you're, you're thinking i would assume as, as a whitetail hunter you're probably thinking a lot about wind right wind direction mm-hmm. brady do you, do you do you think about that when western big game hunting no. when you're out scouting never never i don't either but i should right yeah i mean yeah wind and uh i mean pressure y- like i wouldn't like there's some spots I would never hunt till at least Halloween. Yeah. Cuz I don't want I don't want anything to know that I was there. I don't want the does to know that anyone's been there. <laughs> I'm not educating anything and I don't want to waste my time going in a spot where it's not going to happen. You you're just keeping as much 
of your impact out of that area as you possibly mm-hmm. can. Yeah, usually your best best spots. What I'm learning is I'm pick as we're talking. Like what I'm picking up on is like all the uh, the advantages that I could gain if I just was better at keeping notes and more. You know, if I thought about it more as I was out there, because just as I bring that up, you know, if you're out on a glassing point and you're glassing like prevalent winds, you know, breezes, times that they switch, mm-hmm. all those things could come in so handy. Yep. Right. Yeah. So I guess I'm, I need to buy a notebook. I'm a terrible note taker. I am too. I need trail. You have a note. I see this little iPhone that I know. you now have an iPhone. There's <laughs> a little can, note yeah. app in there. When did the buck come out? When did he go back to feed? When did he bed? Yeah. Why is he betting right there? Does do you do it, how all many that? buddies? Yeah. Are you pretty consistent with that? If I can go on the summer scout, I do. Sure. What it's great. It's awesome. I used to do that uh, a little bit elk hunting in Montana. We used to always just write notes of where these elk were and why they came out. And mm-hmm. we were just glassing them in the summer. Obviously, they're going to move, but we were trying to take notes on it. Yeah. And I was at, I was back in the day in the old write in the rain like notebook. Yep. I have some. I have a whole, I have a, a drawer full of them at home. Yeah. I have good intentions. That's the thing. Yeah. When it comes to note taking and scouting, but now I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting the vibe. I'm, I'm getting jacked to do it this year. Take some notes. Yeah, just be better at it. See what I can learn. It's true. Be a sponge. Just soak everything up you can, man. Yeah. Amen. But you got to write it down. I know. I feel like I, uh, I don't know. Do you feel this way? Like, do you feel like you rely on your your own field craft when you're out there? Like once you're hunting, versus mm-hmm. the prep up to that point. Mm-hmm. Me too. And I think it's a weakness in me. I think I could do a whole lot better on the front end and not so much relying on the back end, you know, the actual hunt, like, yeah, you right. know, trying to figure it out while I'm there. I, I can think of a lot of hunts that I've found success, but it's been at a tail end of a hunt where it took me eight, nine days to figure it out. And then I was able to to harvest. Um, whereas I think if I was a lot more diligent leading up to that, I could do better. So do you think in that sense, too, would you sacrifice some hunting time to gain scouting time right before you go on a hunt? Like, would you go two days before your season open, three days before your season open, knowing you only have a total of seven days total? Or would you rather just hunt them because that way you have a chance to kill that day? If I've only got those days. You only got those days. You yeah, can only I'm take seven days to go on this hunt. Would you five days hunt, two days scout, or seven full days to hunt? I would say it depends on the. Especially, the, especially if you're going on an opening day. It depends a little bit on the tag, but like if I'm going out of state and I'm traveling, I'm going to be hunting yeah. when I'm in the field. Like I'm going to have a permit in my pocket, valid days. You know, I can kill an animal if mm-hmm. I need to. I want to. Um, maybe some other areas. Like if if it's an area that's like the you know the quota is really low. I drew a limited entry permit. You know, and I think I need to you know potentially be the first guy on an animal to get a crack at it yeah then in that case i probably would i probably would give up two or three days on the front end to to scout and have that because i know a lot of bucks get killed opening days on you know limited entry permits because Mm -hmm. guys have done their homework yeah are you saying is my thing off no oh is it quieter you're good are you saying you'd rather you want to e-scout more and like actual feet on the ground scouting more or both just more everything more <laughs> everything more, more. <laughs> more on the front end um yeah more more e-scouting for sure like i definitely need more e-scouting but then like i said it, dep- it depends on the permit and you know if it's a limited entry permit especially for deer if i have a henry's mule deer tag and it's a rifle tag yeah. am i giving up three days on the back end of my hunt to scout for three days prior to opening day absolutely yeah for sure, because I want to be the first guy on that animal on opening day, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm going out of state and it's a general season permit, I'd rather be hunting if I'm in the field. Yep. Depends on the hunt. Depends, Depends on, the hunt. on A lot the of hunt. variables. Tons. Tons. Tons of them. What else you got? Anything else? Man, I think we hammered it home pretty hard. How long was that? It's a lot of, a lot of scouting. Makes me jacked to get on the field that's the problem with these podcasts is yeah. i sit around and i shoot shit with buddies and i talk about hunting i think about hunting i remember hunting stories and now i get jacked 
I want to go hunting. No, I want to go. <laughs> I want to take out some vacation time and go scouting right now. Right. But the bucks aren't growing yet. Oh, man. July. Can't come fast enough. I know. It'll be here before we know it. Well, you guys can go scout your Barbary hunt right now because those things always have horns. Good point. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> what are you doing this weekend? <laughs> I'm just going to shoot it. Sweet. All right. I think we hammered home everything we need to talk about on scouting. Yeah, if you have questions, drop them. Take yep. more notes. Take more notes. Take more a notes. Great, a great takeaway for this podcast. And you can actually drop notes in your waypoints, too, on Go Hunt Maps when you're in the field trail. I've heard that. <laughs> it's a great thing. And you can do speak to text. Like, there's so many. You can take pictures and put them right into a waypoint. Driving down the road, like, oh, man, that, that mountain range looks pretty sweet right there. Drop a waypoint. Check it out later. Like, Just, mm-hmm. just start e-scouting. Just start e-scouting, man. It's I'm bit, going to. I'm ready. I feel like that's the best. A lot of people are almost intimidated, like, because they have no clue what to do. Just start doing something. It's better than nothing. At least you'll go out and you'll actually learn from that experience. I, I got one more question I wanted to ask. This okay. is what I've been thinking. How much time a day would you say is a good amount to spend, like, a, or a day or a week e-scouting? That's a good question. I, just, I think it var- it's, var- it's varies so much because sometimes I don't. He scout every day, but one time I might pull up my computer for like two hours. Mm. Yeah, a lot of mine's like on the weekend and I'm just sitting around doing nothing. I just like I do a lot of mine late at night. I'm excited about just kind of look at stuff. But like I would say like a couple weeks leading up to that hunt or if I haven't done any like boots on the ground, like I am hammering that. Yeah. Like the week before, hammering that thing every day. You've had a hard day. This is your this is your release from the day to to like uh, you know, just get all your thoughts down on e scouting. Like morning or better e scouting. Depends on what kind of person you are. Morning. <laughs> Mine um, would definitely be evening all day, every I day. I do a little bit of both. Depends I, on how I'm <laughs> so <laughs> some mornings I'm kinda tired so I don't and some evenings I'm kinda tired so I don't. So <laughs> what I like to do e scouting in the evening is I make some tea. Oh yeah? Some, some either caffeinated tea or non caffeinated tea. What kind? Earl Grey? Earl Grey. <laughs> Do you? Yeah, I really like Earl Grey, actually. <laughs> okay. Or I have, I have this... Do uh, you have a biscuit with it? I have this, like, mushroom coffee stuff. Mm-hmm. This, like, I can't remember what the brand is. Oh, yeah. It's like, actually, there's no, it's, some of it's non-caffeinated, and that stuff's really good. And I sit there and just sip on a hot drink. Or I've been doing bone broth lately. Oh, yeah. In the evening. A hot bone broth. And then doing a little e-scouting. You do it at night, then? At night. You're a night person, though. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. East, I'm e-scouting with whiskey is also... I yeah, I get recommend. drunk and scout. <laughs> no, I'm not. Tra- <laughs> I'm, just nice. saying, I'm just saying a little Wait bit of whiskey. everywhere. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> see, you could be able to see Look, through I can the computer. Paint with these waypoints. <laughs> you see, maybe you get it from a different perspective. Yeah, you get a different perspective. Drunk. That's what I always used to say. Was it Ernest Hemingway? Right drunk at its, at its sober? Mm hmm. Scout drunk. Oh, it's sober. I wish I'd done that, boys. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing Scout, it wrong. <laughs> Scout sober, hunt drunk. <laughs> yes. No. All right. Cool. I appreciate you. Let's go scouting. Let's go scouting. Let's go to Mexico. Let's go chase some Barbary. Let's, Let's go scout. Right. Amen. All right. Peace out. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Go scout. Go scout. Cool.